Welcome, everyone, to New Polities Podcast. We are happy to be doing another episode of Good Soil, in which we are going to be talking about composting. Before we start, I have to apologize to Sean and Beth because I'm exhausted uh, from driving through the night from North Carolina. And, and I was thinking about you guys because something happens to me when I become delirious and tired and driving, which is that I start to partake in the industrial food economy with, with the vigor. It's yeah. all just yeah. McDonald's yeah. and those little yeah. peach rings that you get at gas stations. I just start eating like oh, those things. Yeah. pork rinds and stuff. It yeah, just, it's just, right. and I feel sick. Oh, it's yeah. disgusting. And I don't know. And I was thinking about why do I do this to myself? Because it's really this thing that only happens on car rides. It's like it entering is, into a kind of mode of consumption. Right. And I realized it's because car rides effectively make us in reality the kind of person that the industrial food oh, of course, and right. really just the commodity uh, world wants us to have, which is moving through yeah. without any sense of place, right. completely rushed, mm -hmm. exhausted on mm -hmm. several stimulants to keep us going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and with no way of, of, of... And with all culture and becoming at us through brand recognition, right? So the, the, oh, yeah. it's how do I know where I am on the road? It's just, it's signs. And then how do I know what to eat? It's more, it's, That's it's right. how, like what is familiar to me is precisely brands that have made their subconscious imprint on my mm -hmm. mind. So and I can do so nothing to real to provide my needs really. Uh, so I have to do it. Well, <laughs> and, and we try and find the little mom and pop restaurants and those are hard to find. They are hard to well, find. Well, you know that uh, Google Maps has this thing. So most people use Google Maps What's to navigate. That? Okay. So it's, it's We're terrible. <laughs> It is <laughs> now you know about computers. Okay. Yeah. So a Our GPS members. system, but it's a <laughs> GPS system that you pay Google for, um, and it's you don't is realize this the you're blue paying line Google. On a yeah, exactly. So okay. you're following the line. It's telling you what to do. It's preparation for it no longer needing to tell you what to do because it will just take you where it wants you to right. go. Um, I was thinking a good idea for a movie would be like a terrorist that just makes everyone go to the same place through <laughs> hacking the GPS system and just see what happens. So it's that pile the people deeper and deeper. <laughs> but anyways, the point is that the, 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 uh, you pay to be, uh, visible on Google's map. So most people are navigating the world through the use of Google, but not realizing that what they see as a possible restaurant is not reflective of reality at least not at first it's a reflective of who has paid for their it's restaurant curated by, right, right, to be right, visible right. and so then you get even more like you already have this just by virtue of the road itself in which money produces larger signs with brighter lights mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. brand recognition but then it simply is incorporated into the phone in which they literally pay for you to see you know what? subway versus yeah, right. something else right. mm -hmm. and and so it's a um so life on the road is sort of this sacramental uh, so of life. Life on the road is like there was a movie a while back. I think it's called Matrix, right? Where people are yeah. in a computer. Right? Yes. Like, okay. So it's like that. Basically, you've you've projected yourself into that screen, and now I exist as this thing moving on a. And, and the Doherty Farm will never show up. <laughs> It'll never show up. No, you won't. Actually, you're hard to find no Thanks matter what. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, and I think it's actually the case that the internet was possible because of the american road system so what i mean is it created the imagination and, and we speak about the internet we at least we did early on in its creation about these sort of digital highways and freeways mm -hmm. and express mm -hmm. lanes mm -hmm. and, and things like this and i think it actually did create the imaginative space we needed to be able to take what we already do with our bodies and our labor through the road system into a sort of information road system just like we have this grid placed yeah, over the yeah. globe and now we place a grid with throughout central laws that are enforced right throughout so all the information there's mm -hmm. a grid and you have to get to things by pathways but we're here to talk about compost so <laughs> <That's> <laughs> just <laughs> like right. i see the connection <laughs> what we want to do with good soil is to introduce the basic habits of agricultural liver, living sorry um as a necessary starting place to a greater cultural revolution or if you don't like the term revolution restoration yes. because i think what we acknowledge here at new polity all the time is the need for the destruction of liberalism and the basic institutions and structures of sin that it creates that we live in a world somewhat like 
the matrix in, in that it is not in close contact with the real, but the real is always being uh, pushed aside for an ideological project that people are through various ways habituated to believe is the real. Okay, so far so simple, but what many people don't do is look at the beginning, which is the land and our relationship to the land as being the place where reality is first touched. So they want to have, and, I, and I, I'm guilty of this, um, they want to have solutions to these problems of modernity. I mean, everyone wakes up and talks about the problems of modernity, uh, but they want the solutions to begin somewhere in terms of maybe it's state policy, maybe it's in <laughs> right, terms of right. our sort advocacy. of advocacy, Somehow, maybe right. it's the selection Proxy. of the entertainments and right. brands, mm -hmm. and maybe right. if we can select the right things to support and purchase and deny the bad things. But it seems like, while well, you could argue for a place for any of that, um, if you're not beginning at the beginning yeah, right. <laughs> uh, with the tilling and keeping of man, then inevitably you have a weaker um, attack than I think you have which is a very, um, in some ways, humble, not very showy attack on the very structures of our, of our culture, uh, of our modern culture. But I think at the end of the day, a more effective one. One that might take three or four generations uh, yeah. To, yeah. to really see the fruit. So compost isn't exactly the beginning. Soil is Soil the is the beginning, yeah. Soil is the beginning. Yeah. And anybody can start growing things in their backyard. Yeah. Almost always the, the land that you own has enough fertility in it that it could grow something. Yeah. But with one of the things we discovered in about two years, if you think you can just keep doing that, it stops working. Mm. By year three, then, the garden's not good anymore. And you think, what happened? I thought I had a green thumb. That's right. I thought and, you could just switch from corn to soy. And then that's that's right. right. That's right. <laughs> and so then you have the next step, which is fertility. Yeah. Okay. And um, compost is one of the greatest ways to start building that fertility. And it's organic matter that's breaking back down. And, you know, you had said about what, just in our previous discussion that, um, we want to talk about people who do that and how they participate, people who compost. How does that um, enter you into the world or maybe the pattern that God has created for us, which is what I feel like our kind of mission has been, is finding that pattern From the beginning. that makes it work so that you can get abundance of food yeah. and the land continues to get better. But the flip side of that that Beth and I just talked about is... What about the people who don't do it? What part of mm -hmm. the pattern are they pulling themselves out of? Sure. What are they missing by thinking that my trash, my whatever's, you know. My personal waste. My personal waste can just be floated down the river. Right. We, we have, an, we have a um, obligation to try and not do that. Well, two things strike me. One is that I think people should know, maybe they don't, that historically composting was not something that you decided to do. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it was right. in fact what was done. That's um, right. And it's only as of, with so many things, it's only recently that it is even possible to take our trash, wrap it in plastic, yeah. send it on a train That's right. to Ohio to and Apex. bury it. That's right. <laughs> right, right. That's right. Thanks, Apex. Um, yeah. But... The other thing you mentioned was being a part of God's plan. And it seems on the face of it that composting is a really, in some ways, obvious way of describing the human being who is participating in what nature is already doing. Because the decay of organic matter and then the production of fertility through that simply is what happens. Right. I mean, barring sort of different ecosystems breaking down what nature does is it builds up a, a sort of layer of leaves and mm -hmm. right, dead animals. And, right. um, and then this breaks down, turns into soil. And so in composting, you see man, not as this kind of existentially free creator who looks at a blank desert of a cosmos and says, and what shall I do? I think I'll compost. Right. Instead, it's man as a shepherd of being, as uh, one who's tilling and keeping something that's already given 
I mean, think about this all the time. Maybe we said it before, but like God didn't give man nature. God gave man a garden. Yes. The processes are ongoing. So then man looks at them, learns and says, and how can I perfect that's, that's, that's perfect our job. them? That's, that's our job. Right. Yeah. That's, right. that's so our cool. job. As, as, so, we, you know, here we are, these creatures that are different from the world in which we live, you know, that we're part of the creation of. We're creatures who can, who have the, image and likeness of God, right? And we're to look at it and not, you know, we, we haven't been handed a brush and told, paint what you like, <laughs> no. but tend the garden. And it's, there are all these activities going on. I like to imagine like this would have been the most fun yeah. for Adam and Eve, that all this stuff is going on and you're going, oh, wait a minute, if I move this right here, if I indicate to this animal that I want some attention given to this spot, then the whole canvas becomes more beautiful. It's yeah. not my painting. Right. I'm just like, I get to be an observer. This is what the video game imitates, isn't it? Yeah. It's stuff going on <laughs> yeah. and I get to reach out and touch it. But in real life, you need to reach out and touch it in dirty ways, like composting. Right. People right. want, we want to be, um, we want to be the thing that we make in a, on a computer screen, that perfect you know, perfect outline thing that moves around and is always happy or exciting or, or effective yeah. and never has waste. Those things don't poop unless somebody's <laughs> trying to be vulgar, right? Right. Never has waste. We want to be that thing when mm -hmm. instead what we are is, is the creature who has to move into the canvas mm -hmm. and touch the things to make it sure. happen. Yeah. Anyway, I took that kind of far field, but yeah, video game. We're, we're New, New Polity is notoriously bad at video game metaphors. Jacob and Mom is shockingly bad. At, <laughs> so we have a habit bad of at using, using doesn't them. Doesn't use them. Does we use don't them, play enough video games yeah, to yeah, understand no. them. Either do I, but I can imagine still. Like, <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. What is that thing? Now, I I um want to know how you guys started composting. Was it just was it just the natural beginning part of the beginning of wanting to be in the country and to be happy in the country and making your own food? Well, I, I do think part of it may be that recognizing the necessity of it. I was going to say it was yeah, necessity. Right. Talking about that, that our gardens, first time around, first year, I mean, these gardens were fabulous. Yeah. Well, Second year, they're still good. By the third year, truly, they are not working. Right. And we're saying, why is this not working? There's a problem mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Are we not tilling deep enough? What is it? But we're not giving back now. And we could give back by buying fertilizer mm -hmm. and put stuff in. But that was never on our screen. No, we did not want to do that. We, we knew enough to say that system is not a good system. So how are we going to add fertility back in? So we would often go off farm and find manure and a horse, you know, and then, you know, at a, at a horse barn or something like that. And then uh, it's a little bit spooky because you don't know what they've been feeding those animals and stuff. Uh, ultimately, we would say, look, fertility is important enough that you're going to take some risks with bringing stuff from yeah, organic matter. Farm. But what a great thing if you can provide it from your own farm. Yeah. So uh, our pigs are our, our primary source of fertility. Well, I, pigs and chickens are our primary sources of fertility. Our cows are constant. That's not even exactly true because in the pasture, our cows are the primary source, but we are not picking it up. We're letting it fall where it falls. Yeah. And we know that it's improving the pastures. Yeah. Pastures are just, in three years, you cannot recognize mm -hmm. your pastures. But we want to be able to control some fertility because we want to put it into the garden yeah. and we're not going to run our cows through the garden <laughs> due to compaction that they would cause and stuff like that. It so do more harm than to, good in the short sure, run. So sure. now we've got to find a way to find an animal or a couple of animals that are going to, and, and what is compost? A lot of compost is stuff that has, you can either create a compost pile and then put all your kitchen scraps in it mm -hmm. and your weeds and everything else, or have an animal chew it up yeah. and start that composting process much faster yeah. and move it through and then take that, the poop, and put it into a compost pile. And perhaps you need to let it rest for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but our chickens, we let them run right through the garden 
during the winter and in the summer when we've got some areas of the garden that we want to lay fallow, we know we're not going to be planting in those, we will run a cover crop, usually a buckwheat, and then we will run chickens through that and they do fabulous And they just put the things. fertility right back in the soil. Right. So we've got yeah. green compost. Yeah. And we've got cow, uh, chicken. So I think most people working with gardens yes haven't yet made the transition to having animals yes so you guys convinced me to get chickens yes and well i didn't need too much convincing but yes. you provided the chickens <laughs> yes so but before that um i was simply doing a compost heap yeah little mm -hmm. pile that's mm -hmm. right and, and and you're feeding rats and what that's happened right. <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah um nice. yeah no i mean it's it is a excellent thing to do and anyone with a little bit of space can do it um, which is just to start taking your kitchen scraps and mixing them with what's called browns so the basics of composting are just that you have greens and you have browns and you should tell me which is nitrogen and which is not what's the greens are nitrogen and they're t typically wet yes. browns are carbon and they're typically dry carbon that's right typically dry so you mix either pre-existing soil um leaves um hay hay wood chips or, or sawdust Shredded paper paper that's where all my newspapers go but the idea is to create a more of a carbon and then less so more of the browns a little, a little bit less of the greens but as long as you're just watching it yeah. and stirring it every now and then well, what's going to happen is it's going to start to break down it's going to start to heat up and it's going to start to turn into beautiful soil that you'll recognize as soil and our um, next step would be let the animals do the turning. Right. Absolutely. So you turn the, the you turn the chickens loose in there, and they will scratch it up and turn it up. And I don't have to be out there with my pitchfork mm -hmm. turning it. They're going to do it for me. Yeah, that was definitely phase two for me was to put a put a fence around the uh, compost and put chickens there. Mm -hmm. And and uh, the third option, <laughs> or the option, the third is you have a pig. Yeah. And the pig that's will... when you haven't just enough of waste right. that yeah. that um and if one, you have a dairy cow you, it would take a lot of chickens to eat waste. it but it, chickens don't turn a compost pile deeply they scratch the surface so if you have a whole lot of waste you can either layer your browns and greens and let it sit for a long time four months six months a year depending on what it is and how wet the environment is or you can introduce all of those wastes into the presence of a pig gradually and the pig will eat, defecate on, turn, yep. and aerate that stuff and make it break down actually more quickly oh, yeah. than it would do in a Yeah, pot. it's always Usually. faster to pass it through an animal, it seems That's to be. right. That's, That's right. right. John Seymour right. said the fastest way he knew compost anything was through the guts of a pig. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I want to, I mean, I don't, I want to emphasize because I think most people will not be in the pig position mode. to, right, to right. we hope they will be soon. Absolutely. I mean, at some point, the necessities of uh, the world of the system, will, that's right, will make make all of these things popular again. Right. Um, we saw this with with COVID a little bit, you know, um, more of a spiritual gesture than a definite necessity. But people started buying chickens, right. Right. not necessarily knowing exactly what to do with them. And I think there was a sort of peasant impulse right, in everybody. Right. That just it wasn't triggered. that long ago that yeah. everybody, not everybody but certainly rural people and there were lots of little farms and they all had a dairy cow and a pig. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and even in chickens. cities, I mean, I remember reading yes. news stories about GK Chesterton who was fighting for laws, protecting apartment buildings in London, keeping spots for chickens because it was just a given that all the residents of the apartments would continue to keep the chickens in one fashion or another. Either. And I think rabbits as well. Right, right. Um, and, that this has become foreign to us is just shows that he was kind of at this transition point where mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. were um, losing the last of those of those agricultural mm -hmm. habits. But what I want to emphasize is that it, it, it's something that is so normal that you can simply do it at any level of yes. efficacy, right? Yes. Like you, yes. you can do it with nothing, worms. Right. People do it with worms underneath their kitchen sink. Totally, just worms and. Uh, a little starter dirt and, and all your I kitchen think, scraps. I think right? One thing that gets in people's way, I mean, the, my earliest memory of the word compost or the, the, the concept uh -huh. of composting was because um, somebody in the community I was living in as a child had, this is in South Texas where it's very dry and things don't compost readily. Anyway, ha, you know, 
encountered the idea of composting and said, let's compost. And so this little pile grew up out by the garden of mm -hmm. layers of, of mostly just garbage from the kitchen, which was a problem. And it did indeed breed undesirable things like rats and flies. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the big obstacles that people have, first of all, you have to imagine, like, why would I want to compost and how does one do that? But getting past those two obstacles, one that crops up is what do I compost? What am I going to put in this pile? If you have very little, it doesn't break down very fast. One of the requirements of composting is that there be a certain critical mass. Yep. And because the biological activity that's going to happen in there, both bacterial and fungal, requires a certain level of moisture mm -hmm. and a certain amount of food so that it can generate some heat and get itself really going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so your average town person, your average anybody would think like, I don't have them. What am I going to put there? So they do what everybody does. They have a little bucket by the sink and they throw in leaves of things and eggshells and they go out and dump it on a spot on the ground and they wait for something magical to happen. Yeah. And the magical thing is rats and flies. <laughs> and, <it's> not, <laughs> and you're not hop, happy about it. Um, and I think one, tr one transformation that happens in your mind over for us many years <laughs> is that everything is compost. Everything, virtually anything that isn't, wasn't manufactured somewhere in a factory is eventually belongs in that pile. Um, your old blue jeans will break down to, unless you, are into like spandex and then not, they won't break down completely, but your old cotton blue jeans are gonna break down to a few rivets and the studs off of a zipper. That's what's left. Why does it all need to go in there? Why, why, why does it all belong there? Well, because that's the fate of everything. I mean, even rocks break down, yeah. but all living things die and then they need to break down. You know, I, I was moved to go I'm not really a big Walt Whitman fan, but I was moved by this, knowing this topic was coming, to go reread his poem, the co This Compost. And um, he ends by saying, I'm terrified of the earth. It gives us these beautiful things and takes back anything, garbage, whatever. But isn't that like, isn't that our whole hope? It reminded me of being a young Christian and saying to an older woman, um, I have nothing to give God. It's all junk. And she said, then give him that. Mm. And that's sort of where we are with creation, that we're to, we were given these beautiful things. Squash, yeah. right? It's yummy. Um, our animals, the hair that we cut off our child's head, mm. uh, whatever. And we're given, it comes to us beautiful and we get to enjoy it and use it. And what's left is defecation or is trash or is shreds or is old and done with. Yeah. And we have to give it all back. Mm -hmm. And if we do, she'll transform it and it'll come back to us beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but I also think yeah. that we're also surprised at how much um, compost really comes from. So we have a B&B, &B, an Airbnb. So we are actually a GPS findable because yeah. of that. But I think GPS takes asked, people to the wrong place. That that's right. It doesn't we work. ask the people who stay at our B&B, sort their trash, and we say we don't have a disposal, so every food scrap should go underneath the sink in an orange bucket. These people stay there for, you know, sometimes it's multiple people, but they stay there for two or three days. They create a lot of scrap. And they're and still throwing away a good deal of it because yeah. it is in the trash too. Right. And one of the things that we always say is everybody should have as many chickens as they have people in their family. In their on, household. Right. Mm -hmm. Because you throw away that much scrap wow. that you would not have to buy any feed for chickens. Wow. And you would be getting the eggs, you would be getting chickens growing up, and they would be making compost for you. You're but, seeing it happen in your backyard all the time, right? Well, it's, it's, it's very... What are you thing. feeding <laughs> your chicken? Are you feeding them? Uh, com or kitchen scrap, yeah. Right, but are you feeding them anything else? Are you feeding I them? have a big bag of scratch grain that I've been yep. supplementing. Good for if you. They sound, supplementing if they sound well. angry. All right, that's the way to go. Sometimes fact, they seem really... You're, you're actually, you're actually giving like the basic instruction in any old farming book about how to feed an animal. It goes more or less like feed them what they'll clean up in 20 minutes. Okay. You know, but that's, 
is not a hard and fast rule, but that's exactly how the husbandman learns to to manage animals, is he responds to what he recognizes in their voices and their behavior. Yeah. To, there's a, there's a chicken a, needs a yeah, more to eat. There is yeah. a wonderful that's book. What's the author? <laughs> the, chicken, the chicken that we oh, just Oh, you're thinking of Harvey S. Reese. Yes. Um, yes, we just wrote a blurb for this book because the second edition is coming out. And one of the things that he is really saying, one of the things he says is, give them feed, but then keep seeing if, make them get their feed from other things, from yeah. compost, from the grass, from other things, Keep pull back working. on their Keep feed a little bit yeah. so that we're down to not feeding our dogs and cats anything. Oh, it's, yeah. it's like feeding, it's like feeding a cat. You feed a cat so that it knows where it lives, yes. not so that it's fed. Oh. I mean, an outdoor cat that has a job or even an indoor cat, if you have mice in the house, needs to be fed so it's happy right it says oh i live here and then it needs to go out and hunt otherwise what's this cat here for right you know? right right for you to pick up electrons as you stroke it yeah. because otherwise what's its job <laughs> um and that's how you feel that's that's how we approach it. in the end that's how you learn to be the the orchestra director yes, of right. a community of plants and animals is yeah. exactly what you're describing they sound and annoyed. we I believe that, yeah. that that's the system that god has created for us a system where it is the system yeah it's it, uh, it's a system that is easy not to believe in or sympath sympathetic feelings make you think oh that's too hard or something like that or but by living in this system and that's part of what you were asking a little bit is what is the value of the habit of composting yeah the value of the habit is that you get deeper and deeper into this pattern if, if it's the pattern, you start seeing that, oh, if I do that, just like you were saying, if I, if I nudge this this way, and then you see benefit come. If I it. toss the little scratch grains down on top of that compost and they're happy about it, they scratch for it and the compost gets turned and then they find some worms too. And so I've just used this, this little simple thing, a little handful of sorghum and this gesture and, I, and it's had this enormous effect right. in this small space. This can be highly beneficial. But the oh, other right. thing that I think that comes from this habit is we start being observant. Mm. We start watching. We start being aware. Right. We are really, one of the things that Beth would really like to do, we just went to Hiram College and they are going to start doing some things with grazing and stuff like that. And she said, you've got these students. Have one of these students follow this cow maybe for five minutes or maybe for 15 minutes or maybe for all day or something like that. I, and I had, just I had write hours down hand. all the things, watch that cow and see what it eats. Mm. Because we think a pasture needs to be this monocrop of high protein that keeps putting the pounce on, but that's not what the cow wants. If you watch, if you follow a cow it's that's grazing, it will eat the things that are considered toxic. It will eat this whole variety of things and keep moving from thing to thing to thing. It's and we have lost that knowledge, that, that attention which Adam and Eve had. And which is incredibly exciting. It is such, such a, such a, um, enlarging thing yeah. to find yourself an attentive part of this 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 ecosystem of yeah. many 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 species of plant and these animals doing things and I suddenly realize I'm a piece of I belong here yeah. right right so that my contact with nature stops being I think I'll go sit in a field because I feel the need for nature and then you go sit out there and you leave dissatisfied because you were simply plunked there for a while right, no right. you really are even in your sleep in your bed you still feel yourself a part of that yeah the it, whole it's, living really, community. it's very interesting that we all want to feel one with nature but not as its master not you know not in the sense of we want a oneness because we're dissatisfied with whatever humanity is we don't want a oneness the way that parents are one with their children a familial relationship right, right. To, and with responsibility yeah I, th I think the other thing well, I, I think we do see... want that I should say I just right right it depends on the meaning of the word want in yeah, this case yeah forget that um, we want it I think one of the things that comes to my mind um, about composting too, and this happens from a lot of causes, but composting is a really good example of it. Um, again, I'm 
I came to Christianity or even to the idea of objective reality as more or less an adult. And one of the words that I didn't know the meaning of was the word purity. I'm not being figurative, although I could be, but I really just didn't know what is that meaning. So, uh, you know, because in the, in the, in the common world, I think I thought it meant something like chastity, which I also didn't understand. But, sure. um, somewhere I ran into a definition that purity has to do with um, granting to each thing the respect that is its due. Mm-hmm. Composting, then, is, is this enormous, complex act of purity. Mm. And it's interesting because then you could also say it's also an act of purification mm-hmm. since it's to take death and turn it, you know, assist it to turn back into life. Mm -hmm. And going back to the question of what do I compost? Um, And the answer is everything that isn't, you know, actually plastic and metal pretty much (laughs) compost, including old pieces of wood, pencil sharpener, shavings, what have you. Um, The thing we are, it is so easy for us to, to devalue, undervalue, not, value we're 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 expert at it it is habitual for us now to hold things as of no account we even hold people as of no account let alone stuff and yet with composting you come to value i kid you not the rinsing of your kid's milk glass right like that cloudy water in our case since so much composting happens through the guts of the pig the bucket under the sink, which is there to, to catch food scraps, you, you don't, without thinking, wash that water down the sink. Yeah. When I do wash that water down the sink, I am consciously feeding my septic system. Sure, sure. <laughs> but the rest of the time, it's going into that bucket because it has value. I don't, de- it is not, not there. Right. When I devalue it, I unmake it. I deny its existence. We are yeah. horrified. When somebody comes to eat at our house, oh my gosh, or where else. we know we are serving the best food in the world, and they leave it on their plate, mm, yeah, that's we <laughs> we don't do that. No, no, all of food. that food down to a piece of bread that scrapes <laughs> that wipes the, the last of the last. Yeah, or we use the side of the fork. But yeah. yeah, we, but we eat it all. We are horrified by that waste of food. Now that's habit, and people. Uh, we encounter this all the time. People go to restaurants, they do that, and they leave all of this food on their and plate. It's going to go food to Apex. No longer has that value, yeah. and it only ha- doesn't have that value because there is so much of it. Yeah. And if we necessity, if necessity made us be aware that that's a luxury. That's a luxury that kings yeah. only had. Yeah. In what, to throw away periods, food? To be able to throw yeah, away yeah. food. Yeah. 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 Well, several things strike me here. One is that it seems like composting makes you a sort of orchestrator of death. And so it puts death right at the forefront of your habitual life. Um, how am I going to? arrange death how is death going to like you said turn into new life and so you become less afraid of death but what's interesting is that for the christian composter (laughs) uh you remember the movie the lion king so there's this mufasa and describing why it's okay for um simba to eat the antelope Brings in the circle. This is the, the circle oh, of life. Yeah, circle right? of well, life. Thank you, Al- Albert Howard and the Eastern religions. Yes. Yes. So, so I want to draw a distinction here because what he says is, of course, we can eat the antelope because then when we die, our bodies turn into the grass and the grass feeds the antelope and it's like a circle. And there's something true there, and but there's something evasive there mm-hmm. because the antelope dies, right? And the grass is not quite the lion and the antelope that eats the grass is not the antelope that died. Like death is real. Mm -hmm. The circle of life metaphor, I think, is inimical to composting. I think the composting metaphor is proper to Christianity, whereas the circle of life metaphor is proper to Buddhism. Because in, in in the idea of the circle of life is that is that life itself 
is continuous throughout all of these elements because, because, because the individuals aren't are important. All in, all in yeah. our imagination, in our mistaken sense of things right. that, that individuality doesn't really exist. Right, exactly. And and I think that that's a good point. It can be easy to hear someone waxing poetic about compost and think that what they are uh, romanticizing is precisely this circle of life, how death turns into new life. But I think it's it's not that at all. Um, it is that partic the particular death of things has a particular importance and it is real death. It goes away, it decomposes, and it's in some ways still tragic. Like it's, it's just that we are the shepherds of this tragic side of existence. I, should, I shouldn't say tragic. That's a yeah, that, that, tragic. Yeah, tragic. That's a scandalous too. word. I think. That's right. right. But uh, we're shepherds of the dying it, of things. Right. Right. We right. we just, have we get farm tours. Yeah. And so people go around there, and often it is children who look in our compost bin yeah. and say, "Where those there bones are bones come in from. there?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a a large, and these are not small bones. Mm -hmm. These are bones from large pigs, 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 sheep and cows that we have butchered yeah. or that may have died. Yeah. And we bury them in the compost yeah. and that's what's there. And that is a reminder is. because all Memento that's more. left of that thing, mm -hmm. when it has been put in the compost bin after a while is this ghastly jaw, white, the, yeah. the, the teeth. Yeah. Yeah. And it is, I think, I think it's moving toward what you're suggesting. Yeah. Is, yeah. It's saying that, Death is not negated in its in its importance by it also being the gift of new life. Um, but one another way to think about this is that I think compost is probably not related etymologically to the word cosmos, but it should be <laughs> because what compost has taught me is that there is a hierarchical order to the creation that we occupy a specific sort of middle space within it. And that when you understand creation in this manner, the idea that there is waste, and I mean waste ontologically, not relatively, mm -hmm. I mean like mm -hmm. that there are things in God's creation that are worthless. That are worthless, um, I have no Becomes doubt. obviously false. The, the, the composter has a habitual way of understanding Oh, no, no, no. They are worthless relative to certain That's goals, right. right? But all, all the things that aren't used are used as, so everything that is waste, I mean, one man's trash is another man's treasure is of course the, the sort of cliche, but it's more like one, one man's trash is another creature's gift mm -hmm. is a gift to another mm -hmm. creature. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not just that I found this with gardening generally, um, is that when you start to um, take ownership of things and and make productive property or make your property productive, you expand in your love and your concern. So like mm -hmm. before I ever had a garden, when it would rain, it would just rain. After I had a garden, when it rained, I became happy because I, I was somehow out there being rained upon, right? <laughs> it was my work. Um, and it was benefiting and I was benefiting as a result. And so there's this little expansion of the person, the person grows. And we see this with having children, right? Like your yes. whole pain of it is that you're spreading out into the world. You're becoming more vulnerable to sorrow and joy because you you are bigger, <laughs> you're expanding. Pregnancy is is in some ways just for women, but it's also supposed to teach men that that you get big <laughs> if you love. <laughs> and so the compost, I think it's another it's another form of that. When I am now, when I'm cooking, yes, there is more joy because before it was okay. I have say I'm doing corn in the cob. Okay, I'm I'm shucking it. And what do I do with this? This trash? is the trash, and then <laughs> here's right. the joy. Is, mm -hmm. is the treasure. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now it's not any more time spent, but there's here is my gift to. At first it was the earth and now it's a little bit to the chickens, mm -hmm. although they tend to leave the, the husks alone unless I chop them. They're up your them. browns. They're yeah. Great yeah. Um, and for so us, here's it's pork my, chop here's my, yeah. So here's my <laughs> gift down 
the hierarchy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then here is my gift up the hierarchy because because right. we don't always think of it this way, but it, both both is happening. So here I'm gonna I'm going to help what's below me flourish. Mm-hmm. So this is my gift to the poor, the ontologically poor, like the chickens. Mm-hmm. Um, and here is my gift to myself. In some ways, I'm going to eat this. And what am I going to do with eating it? Well, I'm going to turn this animal body into spiritual things, into prayer, oh, that's into marvelous. worship, into thought. And so when you're cooking with having compost, you can feel the kind of middle uh, existence of man as a bridge and waste simply goes away as a, as a strong concept. Waste always is just a kind of gift, right? right. And this is even true of human defecation. I mean, it's not, I, I don't want to shy away from this. It's like the fact that we have a society in which defecation has no use while it has certainly, I think created some great cultural possibilities uh to have indoor plumbing and toilets Um, and such uh, at the same time one of the dangers is that we're still talking about not it's a way of not composting right it's a way in which it's a way of denying our creaturehood i think the whole whole thing is just silly we we don't just want not to have to deal with our waste we want to hide the entire fact of waste. yes and and it does not go away and beth and i were just talking about this it's going downstream usually not a gift and it is becoming poison right yeah because we are not and partly because of all the things unfortunately now that we are consuming yeah it's toxic right that are toxic that are getting wasted and that's what's happening. To it does a lot seem of to be a, I'm, I'm not going to call it a law of nature, but something like a law of nature that a gift deferred becomes a poison. Well, and I we're think, back I to the that, habits. Yeah. You know, what is the habit of someone who takes all of their waste yeah. and deals with it as opposed to New Jersey or Pennsylvania who says we have so much waste and we've always just gotten rid of it before. And I'll bet we can find a state like Ohio that will say, sure, we'll take it for enough money. Yeah. And they yeah, will create poisonous uh, That's right. brown, create brown that field smell. Sites. You know, we were just on the way over to. Yeah, our... we just passed Apex and going to Luke's and smelled it coming and going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in New York City, it, it enables the appearance of dealing with trash, right? But right. what it means is that someone else deals with trash. Well, and right? so it goes back and we to know what this. You like just the said Pope about... has talked about this a lot. And, and I think it's really interesting because sometimes with Pope Francis, it's this unfortunate it's this unfortunate thing where whenever he gets on an environmental issue, he gets read as a rote liberal. Right. But when he like he was addressing like his concern with plastics in the ocean. Mm-hmm. And of course, America being what it was, all the conservative Catholics were like, Why do you care about plastics in the ocean when we have abortion or whatever? Right. It's always the response. And it's like like I'm not gonna defend the rhetoric in any particular instance, but Oh my goodness! Both How could we matter. not connect if he's those right, two he's right, things? Right. That's right. The ability to the ability to take parts of the world that are literally invisible to That's us right. and destroy them. That's right. Is abortion? That's right. what abortion right. is: is the invisible people right. die or are po- literally poisoned mm-hmm. um, so that we can continue to live. Yeah, in a way, in the way we want to, right? right. And so that, so that we can yeah. and it is make a matter our of trash comfort. disappear. I mean, in this case, we're talking about so that our creaturehood, which is evidenced by the mess it is to be yeah. a human being, so that that can disappear, just as we disappear birth and death yeah. and defecation, yeah. we disappear our trash. Now, today, I mean, so a hundred years ago, there was very little packaging; most of it was paper. Mm-hmm. or wood and it didn't go away you used it in various ways because yeah. it was useful and eventually it broke down and, and, and could yeah. right could become a gift to the soil again and today as you point out it's interesting to us living spanning from the early 60s to now um to reflect on the the indoctrination of our childhood through school programs about um recycling and mm. uh, using less energy and to watch how the noise and the and the indoctrination hasn't gone away, but the actual effect has been that every individual person creates vastly more yeah, trash yeah. than they did before. They're recycling it. And goes through vastly yeah, more that's energy right. That's right. Yeah. than they did before. And for crying out loud, now you can't walk into the grocery store and just buy potatoes. They're in bags or they're individually wrapped, you know, so everything has packaging. And, yeah, um, packaging is the anti-composting. And I I yeah, I think that 
I think a lot about packaging, more than is healthy. <laughs> I can't. <sighs> And I want to be careful because there's a certain like I get. Well, you know that one of the things that's really nice yeah. on the farm there is no packaging. I know, which we love. Right. So we literally grow yeah. a ton of potatoes, yeah. and none of it's packaged, and it and it goes into it. It often goes into plastic. If there's an milk crate, those milk crates have been in use for ten years, and, and they will be in use for another yeah. twenty. So oh, I'm sorry. Right. I no, it's plastic. not even that I don't like plastic. I mean, this is sort of you have to. Like plastic is one of the coolest things humanity's ever invented to control water. Like I'm not sure whether it's it justifiable <laughs> on that account, but yes. No, but I mean, I mean, I think any technology is justifiable on the basis of it of the need that it serves. It's just yeah. that we live in a ideological world that must totalize everything it creates, um, because the structure of the world is if you can't mass produce it then you can't pay the debt that it costs to make it in the first place. Which is where so, I was going by okay. saying, I'm not sure whether you can, ju I'm not, I, I think there's a great deal of technology that, um, as I was again indoctrinated as a child, technology is neutral, great, that's fine. But the process of getting us to that oh, yeah. technology is not necessarily neutral. Oh yeah. yeah. It can often be, as you say, not necessarily justified by the results. Yeah. And, and, and it is interesting. So compost is something that my wife, if I really want to make her happy, mm -hmm. I could bring a truckload of, uh, it would be Compost the best manure. Mother's Day gift she would ever want, uh, is a truckload of, of some sort of manure or something compost yeah, somewhere, yeah. where yeah. if I were to give her a truckload of broken down computers, yeah. Right. What do you do with that? Yeah. Right. What do you do with that? I think what, what's happening spiritually is that there are two cities, the city of God and the city of man. And, and we are always at war and trying to live in one or the other. And what it means to live in the city of man is to believe that man provides his own security. So it's to begin with fear. Um, and then to say, okay, what is the solution to this fear? Fear of ourselves, fear, fear of our neighbors and fear of the world mm -hmm. around us. And the answer is to amass security over and against all of these things right, for ourselves. Right, right. That's the way of the city of man. And the way of the city of God is really interesting because it begins with the love of God. And so not doesn't begin with fear and then find God as the solution, but begins with the love of God and so finds the problem already solved, which is that um, we refuse to believe that the world is in fact scarce and scary mm -hmm. and that our neighbors are in fact villains. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can understand these things are real as a result of the fall and so that there's work to be done. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so what a sinful society has to do is ultimately um, provide that security from man and to avoid all instances of the revelation that all the works of man are dependent on the gift of God. Right. That you know, sometimes mm -hmm. you feel this way. Right. Because you live in this uh, to give it a really easy instance here. Like we live in this world in which cars and the use of um, machines that run on gasoline is such a given that there is a vast sense of human security. We provide for ourselves, our world and our ability to transport ourselves. But precisely in doing that we have become more and more terrified of what the price of gas mm -hmm. because all it would take That's right. to break us would be $20 a gallon instead of what are we at five or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we know that we know this, we know that it all depends on something that isn't us, right? Oddly dinosaurs under the ground or whatever, you know, um, like, it's not just dinosaurs. I guess, I guess gasoline is ultimately the product of compost, really. Just. Ah, that's a good point. <laughs> or on another level, compost that didn't happen. Sure. Because that organic matter yeah, didn't yeah, yeah. get returned to the organic stream. Yeah, yeah. No, that's actually... We could take that somewhere. Yeah, It'd be interesting, but we could probably... <laughs> almost get a sort of, um, um, what's the word, like a dualism here. I was going to say, I think we'd end up tied in that. But, but the success that you're talking about, or the security that you're talking right, about, right, right, right. comes from money. Yes. Money. If I have enough money, yeah. then I'm... But what was the biblical measure of success? A land flowing with milk and honey. Mm, yeah. That was what was biblical. That was what Abraham, you, you have a land flowing with milk and yeah, honey. Yeah, yeah. And in some sense, 
We have that. Yeah. We have a right. land that flowing. was not meant Our to be Our little metaphorical. tiny farm yeah. is a land flowing with milk and honey. Yeah. And the security that we have is kind of amazing. Absolutely. When when really bad things happen, we're we're gonna be under the you know, under the treads of the juggernaut just with everybody else. But we won't be there because we're hungry. Sure. We'll be there because when because we're we're the human race we're the human community and when bad things happen they're gonna they're gonna happen every oh yeah because i'm we're all gonna come over to your house if everybody came to our house then we would have the benefit of all the people and all the time that's, that's freed true. up so that's it true. isn't that it's yeah. no it's only that um total disruption is yeah is a big mess no, we're all using cars what i wanted to say is that the package is i think a sign of mankind's continued provision it's an illusion but it's provision of what is it ultimately does not provide and i've noticed this sometimes with things that just don't need to be wrapped in plastic yeah why wrap an individual sweet potato in plastic yeah why right. why is it that when why well i, I, I think know. it comes back i think it comes back to security yeah. i if we were to give somebody a handful of our potatoes yes. that had dirt on them yeah because that's the way they came out of the ground. I think people would be suspect. It is very them. funny. People, people but they want to things to be very clean. They want to, and they also want it to know, I trust Kroger's or I trust yeah, Aldi's yeah, yeah. or I trust those things. It comes from a farm. I don't know. They have animals there. Right. They might have disease there. They might have, they have compost. There. Right, right. We are, we are afraid of, everything that isn't um doesn't have the blessing of, of industrialization right so yeah, we're afraid I mean, like of every things... every piece of fruit needs a sticker and a bar right, right. right. It's well like... every birth needs to happen in a hospital sure. there's a there's a, a natural thing that we're afraid of if it's not industrialized um um and i think maybe that's part of what and we're real doing. education happens in a school um sure. i mean there are so yeah. many things that uh, it, uh, this is a little bit off the mark but i think it relates we're afraid of things that haven't been given sort of the human imprimatur. Mm. So um, things that I, things that I like are like people say, oh, no, you can't eat that. It's got E. coli on it. Mm. Right. OK. Or it might have E. coli in it. OK. There are a whole lot of Escherichia coli out there. And the only one I know of that's going to kill you is um, a 15787H7. You want to sound smart, you memorize things like E. coli 015787, <laughs> which is the one that kills people, right? But you're full of, of very mm. various kinds of Escherichia coli, and they're not yeah. going to kill you. But um, I think that we manufacture fears, and then we sell the solution to the fear by packaging the thing and saying, okay, see, now it's different. I, I gave it that imprimatur that makes it okay right. now. So this potato is safe because... It's got a wrapper on it. Yeah. I mean, that's raw, raw clue, milk right? is such an example. Whereas of the that. potato yes. that you dig out of the ground, God only knows what all those creepy crawlies are. And since we can't see them and make friends with them, right. except for via making compost, then we make friends with them. But if we if we don't live in a way that lets us make friends with them, then we're afraid of them. Yeah, and I think the the plastic wrapping has this added value of of not being actually, but at least in its appearance, being very far removed from. The original creation and then the the notion that man is one who participates in the processes of nature it like really does appear to us even though it's not i mean it all comes from nature right but but plastic really does appear to us as something that has no evidence of its origin well, well, what we really want to do is we want to move the whole world toward the inert right because the thing we're afraid of is the living stuff we're not afraid that there might be um iron filings on this food. We're afraid that it's going to have germs or insects or mold. Sure. We're afraid of the living part of it. And where, where are we trying to t take food production, right? The whole idea of lab meats and, and vertical um, hydroponics yeah. is about how ultimately what we'd like to be able to do is, is the thing you see in like um, a Star Trek uh, movie where they press just a press a button and it's fabricated hot, juicy, mm. you know, cr crackly in there, fabricated out of what? Plastic. Out of, I, I think what happens <laughs> is that they've got vials inside that thing that match up to 
the um, the periodic table of elements, oh, and okay. it just goes yeah, and yeah, puts yeah, it together, yeah. right? But, but that's, that's what we're after. Is sure. We're after. Well, and and I think the thing that's the elimination of the living is so. that it's working. Because when you talk to children yeah. it's about where heads. food comes from, sure. they many many children the have store no or the factory, clue. right? Mm -hmm. And that, that. highly suspect of anything that is not wrapped, All right? Which is crazy in a world of like the infant formula recall. Oh my gosh, like, absolutely! You know. Right? I mean, I mean, all all empathy to people who were frightened for their children, but what a marvelous like clarion call. Don't go this way. Yeah, like, right. Nurse your babies no matter what. Right. The only thing you can be sure of is that your breaths will still be there. Yeah. 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 And that there are, well, I might get canceled off of YouTube, but there are <laughs> ways to make your own, if you, your own formula, if right, you are, right, right. Uh, if you are finding it difficult or. Oh, well, Beth did a lot of pumping and nursing yeah. for children who were not. I had special needs children. Absolutely. I had special needs well. children, so I would not have pumped. I was there, sure, but I had sure, to pump sure. to make sure there was enough. Yeah, enough. yeah. Sorry, kids. I know you're not special needs now. You were special needs. <laughs> you're just special. Half of That's you were right. special you're needs. You're just when special you were and needy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, compost teaches us about death. It it makes us shepherds of a creation that goes both up and down. Yeah. Um, reminds us of a pattern. Takes a, uh, yes, reminds us of a given pattern of abundance yes. so that we don't have to be scared of the world yes. because abundance doesn't come from a technology that we develop uh, unless you really want to just go so far as to say, well, composting is a sort of technology, sure. Then in that case, yes our place in the world matters to the world. We do make it more abundant because we're part of That's it, right. not because we're over right. against it. Um, and it also um, takes away the notion of waste as a, as a negation and instead makes the notion of waste a gift to that which is below you in the hierarchy. Um, and I think that this is, and so then the word waste becomes a little bit suspect, right? So mm -hmm. for instance, I think that even the angels to us can be described in some ways in an analogy to this with the way that we serve the animals and then the earth through what we don't use because the angels don't um serve us out of like a need to fulfill their natures as it were like it is i, I can't call it the waste but it is the it is superfluous it is excess it is a gift that was that the angels do to serve us um, you know, the kind of traditional account is that Lucifer was told about the plan that actually all of this angelic power that I've given you is going to be for the sake of these creatures. And, and that was the moment of his rebellion right, right. It was precisely that this would be a waste, right? Mm -hmm. That is not proper to, you know, I, this is maybe even lower T tradition. I don't know. I don't, I'm not putting a stamp of doctrine mm -hmm. on this particular interpretation. This is a very common traditional interpretation of the fall of, of right. Lucifer is that mm -hmm. it's precisely knowing that power was going to be devoted to weakness, ultimately in the person of Mary. Um, and that God himself would, would humble, you know, hummus, humus, yeah. Yeah, yeah, dirt. Uh -huh. um, that, that sparked the Luciferian rebellion, the prototypical Luciferian rebellion, which is to say, I, I will not waste. I will not serve. I will not serve, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but service is always down in right. the entire, and it's always of of our of a of our excess, right? It's always of um, it's always it a seems, gift of ourselves. Put to the that other, way, it yeah. seems like such an easy mistake to make. Totally oh my easy, gosh. yeah. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of thinkers uh, who have talked about liberalism, liberal capitalism as something Luciferian, as, you know. As... I, I, I want to I pursue that just a little bit, too, because I think that a huge obstacle between people who feel some some sort of tug toward gardening or, or animal husbandry or earth care, right, to use a phrase that gets overused now. Um, a huge obstacle is exactly that Luciferian sense of mm. um, 
I'm wasting my time. Not I will not serve, but yes, that this is beneath me. I, when when we first began using um, temporary fence to move animals, to grazing animals in paddocks that are moved daily or even twice daily, and it was it has been from the beginning, principally my job to set up she paddocks. Grass guru. So um, I I I sought to understand and put into words the the. The, the fear, right, that I had about that as I was doing it. So I'm a mom, I've got eight children, some of them are still young, and I'm out in a field for a certain amount of time every day, moving this white string. And and I was afraid, even as my, my mind said, this is a good, and I should do it, yeah. and it's benefiting us, I had this fear. And what it really arose out of it, it took me a long time to pin it down. I used to say, oh, you know, I had this kind of feeling like, what's a college educated woman? Do I and I knew that was the wrong. Sure. I, I wasn't explaining myself well. And somebody called me out on it. I thought, yeah, that's not what I mean. What I really meant is what you just said. I was shrinking from the reality of my smallness and my servitude. And I was afraid to do things on this simple human scale, yeah. unassisted by technology, well, the technology of my real maybe, unassisted by something to move me from place to place faster, like a scooter, yeah. but just to devote me to this lower yes. thing, which is the service of the soil, totally. through the soil, the grass, through the grass, the animal, through the animal, mm -hmm. the milk and the meat. It's hard enough to serve kids, imagine serving grass. Soil, right? Well, to and, say and, and I'm here it's to take care of to dirt. Watch our different, different children yeah. because some of them come to it. Uh, I don't know if we should name names, but Anna, <laughs> Anna comes to it so naturally. Sure. She just, she wants to do it. She likes to do it. You don't have to ask her to do it. She's going to be out there tending the chickens in, and tending these In Anna's these case, things. she can see the the. She can see the web all the way down to yeah, the, she really the can. fungal hyphae in the soil. So you were talking about, and I think we're going to end up coming back to this a lot, the kind of person you become when yeah. you compost. Yes. That's the kind of person you become. That's right. You become a person who, as, as awareness arises in you, I don't know how it gets there, but of what's really happening in this process of throwing chicken kitchen scraps to the chickens and their transforming it into other stuff and then that's going to the garden you become a person whose reality however incomplete is this world that you know starts way out with the stars in that sphere mm -hmm. and goes down to this web of hyphae mm -hmm. in the soil underneath our feet mm -hmm. you know i want to draw an analogy to the gps and the mm. google maps in that my my sons who use google maps will tell me if you go somewhere using Google Maps, you will not be able to reverse and get yourself back sure. without, you know, not in your head, typically. Sure. Um, whereas if you're a map person, the map is in your head and often actually sort of a, a, a satellite view of what you've done is in your head so that you can, you know, where you went to and you can visualize turning it around. Yeah. And it's sort of like that, that you um, composting with awareness, or even when you're not seeking awareness, but you will get there. Composting suddenly connects you all the way down to those centipedes in the soil mm -hmm. and all the way out to the stars that are in, you know, are mapping out the season that is mm -hmm. determining what kind of compost is happening right now. You mm -hmm. know, is it cold season, hot season, wet season, dry season? Um, that's the kind of person you become. You become yeah. hierarchical. You yeah. see yourself suspended in that. <laughs> yeah. and, and I also right, think yeah. that you see the enormity of both ends because the enormity of the stars, of the galaxies, of how huge that is. What's happening in the compost is a world that's way it's bigger. bigger. Yeah, sure. It's bigger. gigantic. And it's alive. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. With all kinds of microbes and all kinds of things, way more than what's on the face of the earth. I mean, and, on, and, on the of, of our size. And just to yeah, carry the yeah. picture a little further, if you were to put that world under a microscope so that, you know, you blew it up big enough to see it, it would be full of scary things and cute oh, yeah, things right. and pretty things. It would look like our cosmos, only shrink it back down. It's in my compost, but it's all friendly. Yeah. It's all okay. Right, right, right. You know? Yeah. No, I think that's what it means to have a sort of natural mastery. 
Well, something. and then it addresses that question of fear. Mm -hmm. You know, that what are we motivated by and motivated often to do the wrong thing, right? Yeah. Is fear. Mm -hmm. And we're, I think that every time we stick our fingers into the soil in a friendly way, we reduce the fear we feel of things as they are mm -hmm. and have less of a need to rebuild, redesign, redefine, mm -hmm. um, Redescribe the world yeah, yeah. as something that it isn't, so that we need not be afraid yes. of it. And put our crackers and boxes with pictures of the crackers. That's on right, it. and and <laughs> and flush toilets that make right. that use potable water to take nutrients out of the food system. Sure. Picture this for a moment, everybody, if you will: an ecosystem of animals and plants, unassisted by human beings, from which nutrients are systematically bled off all the time. We can all see that that is going to decrease in available micronutrients over time. Mm -hmm. It's just obvious. We've just described anywhere on the planet where flush toilets exist, right? Mm -hmm. We have just described our choices. I don't care how attached you are. I don't mean you, Mark, but just <laughs> the world. How attached you are to hitting that little silver handle and making it all disappear. letting ourselves rest in the fact that we're more comfortable with it and saying that takes care of the question settled there are good yeah is beneath us as human beings I, I, yeah. it feels good so it must be fine i grew up with that yeah, attitude yeah. and i know it doesn't work i, I do sometimes get excited sorry about I the get... possibility of if everybody who listened to this podcast yeah said i'm gonna stop wasting did one thing yeah, one yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. one choice. Right. And that sounds so kind of <laughs> touchy feely and all that kind of stuff. But I think what a, what a great thing it would be if everybody had put a bucket underneath there mm -hmm. and started composting and then got chickens. And then it is whether you're in the city or not in the city, okay. that, that you said, I'm going to stop wasting. And that might cause other people. I, I do think that it could make a dent. All three of us sit here as examples of that because every one of us started out in some. Oh, that's right. No, I know. It's City setting, you know, working along with things as they are. What moved you, Mark? What moved you to put in a garden? What made you want to do that thing? Oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, really we, before we were talking about two fears, and one is that food is unwholesome. Yeah. The other is that it won't be there. No, I just think I wanted, I, I did it in the way you build a sandcastle at the beach. The material is there and you find your hands doing it, you know? Well, and, and I, oh, that's marvelous. Can that, you, can, can you like draw that out? Well, I, I, uh, I don't know. We talk a lot about, well, we literally are talking about the kind of person that a composter becomes. But if you asked your daughter what she was thinking about as she was working in the garden. I don't think she'd be thinking about the stars didactically, nor would she be think, marveling at the intricacies of the lower ecosystem Not most beneath her, right? She'd be doing the work. And I think that's what human beings are. We do the work and every now and then if God lets us, we think about it. That's exactly yeah. right. And, but I think it, for, for me, it then works the other way around. It's like the, the, it's not, the world is real. It's not a game. It's not something yeah. that we look at and we see, oh, I see real value in right. composting There's not value an alternative to it. It's like when you go out into the world, barring a active ideological effort to suppress the appearance of reality into something that it is not, barring that, you will begin to garden. All right. It's like I have a, a yes. pro right. professor right. friend who who teaches poetry and and every now and then he's he's catholic and he he's a catholic poet and so he he often gets the sort of question from catholics like how do we get good catholic poetry how do we like what do we do what what steps do we need to get good catholic poetry because it's all cringy and, and bad so how do we make it good and his answer was always i think the only answer you can give which is you can't make it happen it happens you have to just be there for it. I mean, the the world is real. It really is inspiring. It really does inspire poetry. So the question is not, what do we do? The question That's is, true. what do we stop doing if we're yeah, lacking right. in poetry? What do we stop right. doing if right. we're lacking in gardening? That's marvelous. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it, it, 
I really don't have anything to tell people in terms of what motivates you to garden because I could I could pretend like oh you know you've got all these health benefits and you'll be out in the sun. Right, 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 and, right, right. And, um, it's my uh, a philosopher that I like Zizek speaks about this in terms of the the liberal um, uh, advocacy of sex, which is hilarious because you'll hear like uh, sort of like institutionally pro sex. Uh, groups saying like, well, it's a real health benefit and you burn all these calories. And, <laughs> and he's like, this is disgusting. This is the most disgusting thing you could say. And I think it's, he's right. Not, not just about sex, but about realities. When you describe it as the, um, as, as sort of external objects that fulfill a sort of gaping need for various things in that's an right. individual they're life dials, that's separate they're from They're dials them. on a board that I'm adjusting to get a good yeah, result to myself. Someone said that the definition of, I think they said neoliberalism, I would really just apply to it, is that is the fundamental programmability of reality. And I think that's, that's what I tried to avoid. It's like nothing got me gardening besides Doing the it. world. Um, of course, my dad gardened. So that I can I can trace it to various things, but my you know that you, you don't want to end up in an uh, absurd argument that you only garden because you're taught it by someone else. Because obviously you have to answer for their motivation right, and right. their motivation. And unless you want to say there's an unbroken line from Adam to, right. to me, then right. you're well. In one sense, there is. But right? in another sense, but, we know that it, yeah. it does break, and yet, and yet you can still garden. So, anyways, but but all of which is to say that I think. The reason the question of agriculture has primary political importance is because what we are suffering is detachment from reality. Um, in various guises, this is the problem. And we will not be able to short circuit man's fundamental, um, the school of reality as it, as it were, which is, which is because the, the world's land. real, where you yeah. started. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so I think everyone should compost. I, <laughs> I recognize, of course, that we live. It, it's this. Uh, it's a sort of positive feedback loop where, when we don't compost, we become more likely to live in situations in which composting is impossible, which then creates the condition in which uh, you, you would never even think about composting, and then it makes it way more difficult. Right? Okay. It's like a people that composted and wanted to would never live in high rises. Yeah. Right. Right. Although, although but now we, now we have vermiculture. Now we have high rises. Well, yeah. But right. now we have a, a, like under the kitchen sink vermiculture. So we've got an answer for the people yes. who can't compost. Yeah. Everyone can. Shredded, everyone can pa do shredded it. paper and kitchen scraps and red worms. Right. But then the question is, what are you, what are you doing with your dirt? Right. Right. So I think hopefully we can... you, you have gardens on the balcony, but well, yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. But you'd rather not live in the high rise and have to do it that way. Right. Too. No, but I, I understand if, if you do. Um, okay. So what I want to end with, because I think we've given at least a best uh, of an idiosyncratic <laughs> justification for letting things rot in a good order than that I can imagine. Um, cause I want to talk a little bit about practicality here. Um, so if you want to compost, obviously it's unique to your situation. Um, but I think you should go forth with the confidence that it's a human art and not something that has to be deeply learned. What's awesome about agriculture is it's margin of error is huge. Yes. Enormous. I'm always looking for jobs that have large margin of error. Yes, I built right, a wall recently right. and it's great because the kind of test of my accuracy was me looking back and going, well, that's not the good. It looks pretty that's good. Right. Right? I'm uh, not measuring uh, anything. I'm just right. Agriculture is like that and composting is definitely like that. So your tentativeness is you can just go forth and start, which is really fun. Um, but definitely make sure you have a supply of browns in your mind because this is what I found is that your kitchen is regular because you have to eat. So you're always producing kitchen scraps. But your browns, your carbon-based things, your dry things are not as certain. I think you can do... A, pretty much everything you need to do by raking people's leaves and taking them. Absolutely. So if you live in that or, situation. Or the thing that we started with, which we got a ton of, was grass clippings. Yeah. Well, but grass and, clippings are browns or greens, depending on whether they're dry or wet. Yeah, but <laughs> I mean, you can leave them and let them go yeah. brown. And they are going to go brown okay. quickly, yeah, yeah. you know, so that they if are. They're, gonna, if what, they're, what is the reason? They dry out. Yes, what are the reasons for the brown? Well, that's true. What are the reasons for the browns? The reasons for the browns are so that we are not getting so much smell. 
that so they here, are here's a little basic kind of chemistry. masking the green. Uh, um, your high nitrogen stuff tends to move toward ammonia. Ammonia is volatile. Ammonia, if it doesn't volatilize and go off in the air and be lost and be stinky, will get washed away by the next rain. So what you're trying to do is get an actual chemical bond going between your carbons and your nitrogens. And if you put all your high nitrogen stuff, think um, wet kitchen scraps, Banana peels, manure, coffee yeah. grounds. Yeah. Coffee grounds? Um, coffee grounds are high nitrogen. Yeah. Though they have a lot of carbon too, but they're wet, right? Yeah. So if you dried them out, they would probably serve as browns. But when sure. they're wet, they're not going to do a lot of absorbing. Yeah. But, but, what you're basically trying to do is use carbon to soak up and and tie down. I don't actually know if it's a physical or chemical bond, but and tie down your high nitrogen. So and, and, and a bale of hay from the from Absolutely. anywhere from the feed store or something like that would do a tremendous. It would go a long of, way towards city yes. city composting. Yeah. Sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Although these days it's also expensive. Well, but there's other and there's other things to do too. I mean, to simply bury your kitchen waste mm -hmm. in the ground, mm -hmm. if you can dig a trench, mm -hmm. bury it and cover it, is you. You've done it. It's, it's better you, than nothing. It's better than nothing. Yes. Because it's, it's not. Right you will see the amount of worms that come yes. to that are just enormous. Right. So, so one thing that I would point out about composting, because it is your point, which is that it's easy and the margin of error is very broad. Um, and this is true of almost any, any farm activity you want to look up on YouTube or look up on the internet and, and learn about. Almost all the directions, almost all the time, are way too picky and don't acknowledge your broad margin of error, right? The the spectrum of acceptable is very wide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the way from burying your household waste in a trench to um, the fancy compost tumbler mm. that you charge at a certain ratio so that you can tumble it three times a day. And at the end of 12 days, you've got broken down compost, hooray for you. Um, the spectrum is extremely broad. And so I would, I would encourage people to realize that um, if it doesn't smell really bad and grow flies and attract rats, you're probably doing it just fine. Yeah. Totally. And don't let somebody tell you otherwise. Yeah. yeah. And, and we highly recommend as you, as you are doing that the compost bin is on your future garden site. So that yeah. all you have to do is move that, and here's your garden. Right. It's just your like place magic. To... And yeah, given that, yeah. given that so many of us are going to be working on garden sites that um, are so far from being undisturbed soil that there's no soil there sure. at all, yeah, right? Because yeah. the, the the modern way of building houses take a bulldozer and scrape off yeah. down to the subsoil to the and then start working yeah. from there. Um, composting on a site is this bit of alchemy that, um, you know, will restore your belief in magic because if you build a compost pile on this rotten piece of soil and you let it grow up for a year and move, you know, say you've got chickens in it, that's yeah. even better, and then move it over, suddenly you have this magic garden that will, mm -hmm. things will spring. You know that things will spring and grow like Audrey in, in Little Shop of Horrors because those few tomato seeds and squash seeds that we're still in that compost. They go off, yeah. Oh, I'm, oh my gosh, they're the biggest and best. I think I could just live off of the things that the things that pop up. I just like was good at transplanting. <laughs> them. Right. I wouldn't even use seeds. I just like well. I Actually, I mean that's not even. You're not even of really. This year from. Right, I was going to say you're not even kidding. No, no. What no. happens with something like tomatoes and squash is um, the genetic base is so broad that you never know what your tomato seeds right. can actually produce. Right. Will it produce little tiny ones? Will yeah. it produce big ones? I'll tell you, it, it's tend, it's going to tend toward making the tiny ones, yeah. but they will also be like wild strawberries, the sweetest and the best. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And the ones that were easiest to grow. The other thing that I would mention is if you are in a situation where you don't have the space to compost, it is always great to do it in a group yes. um, because you can... Again, as you mentioned, it has a sort of, it does well on a it larger has a level. It critical mass. Mm -hmm. uh, I presume there's a level that's too large, but that's more because you become unable to manage it, not because it's... I think that's true. Yeah. There is so there's like much a, property. There's composting done on the level of Industrial, giant hills, yeah. no, right? Very cool. But there is so yeah. much property all over, very close to urban areas sure. that yeah. is not being used. Yeah. And our properties, both our B and B property and our home farm were horrible. Devastated zone. <laughs> if 
covered with clay, uh, but I mean, scraped down to nothing. Yeah. Uh, it had been left alone, so it had grown up into it's briars and there. just yeah. terrible, terrible soil. Yeah. And the uh, what we're able to grow, I mean, we truly grow 90 to 95% of what we grow, but More also what our animals, we are not, we are not right. bringing in feed for the animals. We are, you know, they are surviving on what we have on the farm. Yeah. Yeah. It's wild. All right. Well, that's us for today with, you know, a lot of uh, so, justification. So, can, a lot can of, I interrupt you for just yeah, a second, please. Mark? Um, so. Oh, right, right, right. Can I give a plug yes, to the healing plug land? away. So I don't know if you can see the, the healing land, right? Um, what I'm giving a plug for is if this interests you and if you are looking for chances to expose yourself to gardening skills, composting skills, farm skills, um, some ways that you can do that, that we can make available to you are through the organization, The Healing Land. Don't leave the the off if you do a search because it'll take you somewhere totally different if you just go to Healing Land. The Healing Land is just a name that's been given six people who are organizing um, local farm skills workshops. And um, we put them on periodically. And if you go there and look us up, you'll be able to find some of the things we do yeah. and avail yourself of them. Yeah, like I got to go and figure out how to kill these chickens. Right. Okay. So <laughs> Ashley, I think, will be giving a, 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 yeah, a chicken butchering workshop yeah. um, in September when we do our, our big day of workshops. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it's really, the, the Healing Land's been a wonderful addition to the to the movement here in Steubenville. Um, to this to this sort of um, constellation of interesting things happening in Steubenville. Yeah. Because people who, who like them and want to make them happen, just do them and don't worry too much about. Yeah. Um, and, and more and more people yeah. are, are saying, oh, I want to join that. I really, loved, I really loved when you said that um, we make decisions about how we spend time. And if we prioritize happiness, that I'd be happy in what I am doing, it usually means that we'll also have to deal with um, a smaller income. Yeah, that's right. And um, Steubenville's full of people who said, yeah. I will do the thing that seems to me good because the good makes me happy and I will deal with the smaller income, yeah. which makes gardening really valuable. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Once, once you even add the slightest bit of necessity, uh, and, and gardening becomes, um, what I think it was meant to be, which was never a hobby or a leisure no. activity or a, option. or a way to produce a, a, something that wins at the state fair. Right. Yeah. Or something to sell. It's so fascinating that, that the, how integrated this discussion is with like a, a conversation I'm much more familiar with about the church's teaching on things like contraception and abortion. And, um, we're very familiar with the idea of, of, na uh, of things being good that are also not options yeah. right? of, of motherhood or fatherhood being something that belongs to us by nature and that we have an element of choice in it, but it's always a choice to be who we are. And so it always transcends choice and, and becomes an obligation. Well, I, I loved and where like, I felt like you were going. I wasn't <laughs> sure if you were going with the, with the farming that if left that we are drawn to farming. Yeah. We all want to farm in some way. It is our nature. And right. It is part of our nature. And it is something that, you know, I love the idea of art being something that that's an artist in some way really connects with God through doing his art form. But I, you know, in some ways I used to teach theater, but now I farm and it is now my art form. Mm. And the thought that, that we participate in a very special way with the work of God, with what God does through farming. Mm -hmm. well, through I, I would like to pull it totally out of the optional category too. The definition of human being for, for most of time would have been in some way agrarian, right? right. It's, only, yes. it's only some of us in the present that imagine ourselves independent of, right? right, 
objectively removed from. People would have laughed. Agriculture. That's right. If you but, had said, we don't have to farm, <laughs> they would have said, what do you mean? But to, to, to maintain that attitude, we have to grant a certain omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence to human technology, right? Yeah. To, to, to take that point of view, we have to say, well, mankind through technology and the thing we call civilization has provided it is provided for. It is no longer an issue. I can I can remo remove myself from the necessity of agriculture. Not for five minutes, you can. Not really. So it's really, it's everybody's calling. Yeah, right? no, and I think maybe one of the worst things to happen, maybe one of the worst pieces of advice that we give to children by rote is we say something like, do what you are best at. Mm -hmm. Like find what you're best at, your special talent, and yeah, offer that to God. I find this to be quite poisonous because it okay. pairs totally with the liberal society. Because um, what this inevitably ends up meaning is only do that thing which separates you from the humanity. Oh, that makes you different. Yeah. That makes you special. Yeah. It's like, but, but it's, it's precisely the idea oh, that we yes. have a, a talent for the land as human beings, not as particular vocation, not as a particular right. skill, not something that we sit down and think, what am I for? And what, what's right, my right, purpose right. in this life? It's already given in the way that our it's bodies are. are given to us. Uh -huh, yeah. Uh -huh. Cause we're, we get hungry. And, and I think there's such peace in that. I mean, uh, Contemporary life yes. is so anxious because so much emphasis is put on distinguishing ourselves because we have to ironically imitate the model individual who is not like anyone else. And so, of course, it's yeah. like everyone else who is trying to not be like anyone else. Um, and that whole rush, that whole anxiety has us forget that we are our own lesson to ourselves about who we are. Like, look at your need to eat and know that you are the kind of being that can intelligently produce food and that this is not anything this is who you are and so you already have community with everyone else on it on this basis you know and so i, I mean i was thinking about what you said this this fear that what you were doing when you were out in the pastures was beneath you but i i'd almost think that what christianity does is it takes that very luciferian temptation and says if it is beneath you it's because you serve what is beneath you, right? Like to, for something to be beneath you is is an obligation yes. upon our yes. humanity to then to then raise it up. Well, and, and, and the relationship we have with our milk cows is exactly that. Right, we right, move right. them to another pl place of grass, yeah, and then we bring them in. It, they don't work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. they eat, and then they're moved, and then they're brought in, and we milk them. And we are love. serving them, and then they serve us yeah. beautifully well as well. Yeah, so, yeah, that's yeah. that's marvelous. There yeah. they are that that the thing that is beneath us then is not beneath us, and therefore we should separate ourselves from it. Right. But it's it's beneath us to be reached down into. Yeah. And you know, it's it, beneath us, like the infant waking up in the night and crying is beneath us. That's right. right. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. And it's and it is having having been a mother, being a mother of eight children and eight living children, and having raised them for the most part. They're not all completely raised, and then also being a gardener and a tender of soils and a tender of, of pastures. Um, I would say that it, there is something very similar in the enrichment and the enlargement that yeah. you feel of yourself mm -hmm. and in the enlargement of your heart mm -hmm. that happens when you are at the service of that thing that is beneath you yeah yeah no, it's all it's all there and what continuously surprises me is that for all of our discussion correctly of christianity as a sort of unique historical event that changes everything it's also the fulfillment of our nature. So it's it's also precisely what is most to hand for us, what is most normal, is to see our power as being for the weak. And in some ways, this is an achievement of Christianity, absolutely, but it's an achievement over and against a fall, right? It's an achievement mm -hmm. of a lie or a, a victory against a lie that uh -huh. said, no power is for ourselves. We're supposed to become more and more like God. We're supposed to be mm -hmm. more and more mm -hmm. isolated in our to serve ourselves with their power and so all of which is to say compost because then you will know 
<laughs> on a yeah. very experiential level. Um, mm -hmm. That service to the weak is the is not just this lifestyle choice within a cosmos of other possible choices, but it's actually to begin to be of the cosmos, to begin to be ordered as the cosmos is ordered, to begin to take up your place. To be, begin to be human. Yeah, I think right. so. All right. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed. Please, if you have any uh, compass attempts after this, good or bad, let us know. Tell We'd us love about to talk it. about them. And uh, thank you, Sean and Beth, again. Yeah, thanks for thanks having for us having again. Us. Yeah, we'd love to come back. You will. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>